we're at the end here. <laughs> when I was in university, um, my very first year. I forget why, I was just procrastinating on exams. I think I started making games in a program called Adventure Game Studio. And that's how it all began in 2005. Um, so my talk is divided into two parts. The first half hour is my design postmortem, the decisions I made at Gravity Ghosts, and how it became what it is. And the second part is the business side, and kind of build a business without having to expend really very much money at all. OK, so you got to see how Gravity Ghosts plays. Uh, you basically use the gravity of planets to navigate, and it's hard to tell from the videos, but it's actually quite tricky. You don't have um, a lot of, the, the girl has control, but she doesn't have as much strength as the gravity itself, so you end up being kind of tossed by these almost invisible winds. Uh, so it, it takes some getting used to. Uh, the game also features a half an hour of voiced story that I um, animated myself. I actually have a background in doing cartoons for the newspaper as well. So, um, same as Neil from this morning, which is a strange coincidence, but yes, um, so I ended up doing all the art myself as well. So when I started writing this postmortem, I went back through some of my design notebooks. I kind of I keep fastidious notes, and I use kind of paper to, to get through, um, when I have an idea about something, I like to work it through on paper. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just go back through my notebooks and kind of make this nice straight line painting how the game got to be where it is. But I'm not very organized, and so my notes happened in a lot of different notebooks, so I actually took quite a long time to put this whole picture together, but you'll see then throughout this talk my, my notes and what I was working on. So I can say um, at least where the game started without a doubt was um, I was trying to learn a program about five years ago, and uh, my now husband Steve Swink said, um, you should try to make something simple, something like asteroids maybe, a simple game with this ship that flies around, you know, things shoot at you, bullets, etc. You can learn to code these things. Um, so I started to make that, um, but then I realized I didn't really care about the shooting. I just wanted to make the trail behind the ship look really pretty. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the, the ship had to fly around gravity wells that would pull on you and you had to correct for that? Um, but I didn't know how to draw a gravity wells, so I just made them into planets. Um, the next idea I had was, uh, wouldn't it be interesting if the ship could land on a planet and then you could get out with a little character and walk around? And I had this idea that maybe you could plant trees and have this garden. Uh, I was inspired by a game called Euphoria, which came out around the same time. Um, it was uh, actually a very zen sort of RTS game. You should check it out if you're interested. Um, and so I, I had this idea that you're exploring this kind of peaceful galaxy and meeting strange people. So I've drawn um, on this, the right there, there's a planet with some weird bird people. And I didn't really have an idea for the story at the time I was just drawing. Um, so around a couple months after I started programming, I went to a thing called TIG Jam, which is a game jam. Now, uh, can you raise your hand if you've done a game jam or know what they are? Okay, actually not as many as I would have thought. So in a game jam, you usually go for a small amount of time, usually a weekend, to a certain location and try to finish an entire game or an entire idea. And it's a really good way to like force, your think, force yourself to think about what is important about my game idea and just get rid of everything else because you don't have a lot of time. Uh, and at the time, I, I hadn't been programming for very long, so I, I just didn't know how to do the getting in and out of a spaceship thing. So I just cut the spaceship entirely and made it into a character walking on planets and jumping. Uh, and then I accidentally met a guy named Ben Prunty, who ended up being our musician. He was sitting next to me at a table just by chance, and he said, can I do the music for this game? And I was like looking at him like he was crazy, because it was just like cubes and boxes on the screen and circles. And I'm like, you don't, you don't even know what this game is. He's like, it's in outer space. I like to do those, so you should let me do this. So, uh, he actually ended up doing the music for a game called FTL after that, and became pretty well known for that. Uh, but it's funny, because people congratulate me now. They're like, oh, you got the same musician as FTL. No, I had him first. He just got really famous. <laughs> Um, so that ended up very much influencing the feel of the game, too. His music is a big, big part of it, so I'm really happy to have met him then. Um, so after the game jam, I kind of had a prototype working. I got a little bit of art in there. I was using just uh, origami paper textures at the time to kind of give it this handcrafted sort of feel. Um, and I thought about, you know, what are, what are some of the levels in this game going to be like? What should I do? So I thought, oh, maybe there's collectibles, you know, and um, maybe there's also, it's like an exploration game, so it's a great big galaxy. You're trying to get through it and find out what else is out there. And you're going to find weird people. I haven't really thought it through very much. I just thought, yeah, great big levels with lots of stuff to find. So I uh, worked on that for a few months, and then for GEC that year, I kind of come up with this complete prototype, which I will show you.
this actually still ships the shooting you in this version. You can see there. Left over from the spaceship game. Alright, so it kind of has the appearance of some of those ideas I mentioned, but the trees didn't really do anything. Um, it was just mostly a, a kind of a prototype to see if it was cool. So after that, people played it and they really liked it. Um, it, was, it still had a lot of problems. It was very difficult to predict what was going to happen whenever you jumped. Stuff would pull on you and you'd, if there was a planet like way out here, you would jump and it would pull on you and you wouldn't even see what was pulling on you. So there was a lot of problems with it and I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't really realize how much of a challenge it would be to make a gravity game. But at the time I just thought, this is fun enough, I want to make this game. I had no money. <laughs> so I got a job. Um, I went and I found some work in educational games up in Madison, Wisconsin, kind of up near Canada. It's very far north in the United States. And for a year, I, uh, I stayed with a friend of mine who was, she was a grad student there, and I slept in this sleeping bag that I borrowed from my brother, who was in the Boy Scouts. Uh, and this is how I saved money. So I didn't, you know, get a hotel. I like really tried to cut out everything so I could put everything into savings. So I could, you know, this would be my gravity goes money. That's what I'm going to do. So. Um, Despite uh, having a full-time job, I managed to make a little bit of progress in Gravity Ghost that year. Um, I went from the idea of having a great big uh, level with a bunch of planets to having just individual levels with a couple of planets, and that made the game way better because at least the gravity was more easy to predict. When you get close to a planet, it starts to pull on you more. It started to feel a little bit more like an actual game. Uh, and it, this is where I first came up with the idea of in each level, you need to get the star to open the door, and that's the, the main objective. And it's funny because it sounds so simple now, but at the time, just having a game with gravity where you jump around, it was fun to move around, but I couldn't think of like, well, what do you do in this game? So I just came up with like, okay, there needs to be a little reward for when you figure something out with the gravity, when you have a little bit of mastery, and that's before the star comes in. That's why the collection is important. Uh, so by the end of that year, I had about 25 levels of varying quality, some of which made it into the final game. Most ended up not being good enough, I thought. So, yes. Um, around that time, uh, the game looked something like this. Um, this level actually ended up in the final game, but with water planets, and with only about six of them. So it, the levels really, really evolved over time. Generally, it was a good idea to cut out planets and keep just a couple, the minimum number of planets, so that it was easier to predict what was going to happen. Um, so at the start of 2012, I thought, it's now or never. I need to try to make this game happen for real. So I quit my job and uh, commissioned a poster. It's real now because of poster. Um, and then I, uh, I put out the word to some of my game developer friends. I said, I'm looking for a programmer, somebody who knows how to make weird prototypes in Unity with physics. Um, can you recommend somebody? And a couple of times this name came up, Mike Stevenson. He's the guy in the front there. In the back, that's Ben Fronty, the music guy. Um, and so I, uh, I like, we had lunch together at GDC that year. And I'm like, hi, here's my gravity prototype thing that I'm working on. It needs some work. I could use the help of a, you know, a, programmer who can do heavy lifting. Uh, and then he like pulls out his laptop and he's like, well, here's my gravity prototype that I'm working on. And I'm like, okay, so we're trying to solve the same kind of problems. And he's like, how did you solve the problem where the character goes flying off into space? I'm like, let me tell you. So we already had a pretty good working thing. I had a good feeling about you know us working together. It ended up working really well. So um, I'm gonna show you what the game looked like around this time. And this, this video has no sound, so I'll just talk over it. So if you recall, I still um, wanted to have a game where you planted trees and uh, kind of did some gardening on these little planets. That seemed like a good idea to me. Um, so here, the girl has gotten a water trail and she's picked it up from this water planet and she's using them to like, I guess, uh, start to develop these planets and terraform them. So then you can get a dirt trail as well. Uh, and really the reward loop for that was just, oh, once you do that, this thing runs out of the ground and you get a star for that. So it wasn't <laughs> a very sophisticated sort of reward loop. Um, one other thing I'll point out about this demo, um, well, two things. One is that I thought that we were going to need to have a visual on the gravity to let you know which planets were influencing you and how strongly, because I thought the gravity is invisible, this game is really weird. The character actually goes upside down, and that's not something they usually let you do, so I thought we needed to have this like visual, but it ended up not being necessary. People were able to figure it out over time. It just, uh, it's probably a very good decision that the game didn't have a way to lose because otherwise you would spend a lot of time dying because it's hard to like get the hang of what's going on. So the lack of a fail state I think is really what makes this design work. Um, another thing I, I notice when I look at this is the girl's movement is very snappy. It almost looks like she's on the end of a rubber band uh, being pulled towards planets. You know, it's not at all like what the final game ended up being, which is very floaty. Um, and so I think I focused too much on this terraforming idea and didn't pay attention to what was cool about the game. Um, so in this level, you combine dirt and water and seeds to terraform and like, some flowers grow. It makes a nice noise. Um, 
but it didn't really do anything. I thought, oh, you know, the, the flowers give you more hair, and the hair lets you make more plants with flowers, and then that's a nice little game loop. But then people would play the game and be like, and then what happens? I'm like, oh, well, back to the drawing board. So, um, uh, around this time, we also ended up with the biggest dead end in our development. Um, and it was an idea I had that I, I was really into this, like, gardening idea. <coughs> So here you can see seeds being planted on this planet. I wanted to make the trees look nicer now that we had the trees working. So nice L system trees. We had these are carrots. You can see them in the ground here. Um, I really liked how this looked, you know, but it was a lack of playtesting that I didn't realize that just terraforming for its own sake was not very really fun. So we ended up cutting that. That's not in the final game, uh, and that was kind of a big learning experience for me. Um, terraforming wasn't fun, so. Had to go back and redesign something. Um, so I thought about, you know, what is fun about this game? It's the physics. It's running and jumping and controlling your momentum. Uh, and so we should try to play into that. Let's try some new types of planets rather than just the one. Uh, so the next couple of things are our ideas that worked pretty well right away because they worked very well into that running and jumping sort of system. Um, we had some planets with new physics properties, like I mentioned. We had some movement power-ups we put in, and then we had how I rescued the terraforming idea, terraforming 2.0, if you like. Um, so anything that had to do with controlling momentum seemed to work pretty well. This is my sketch I did sent to Mike for like, I need a breakable planet. If you're going slowly, you just land on it, but if you're going fast enough, you smash through it. So automatically, that has a certain energy and, and dynamicness to it, and it worked pretty well from the beginning. All I had to do was tune the value of how fast you had to be going for it to break. Uh, another idea that worked pretty well were the mazes. Um, originally, they when the girl ran left and right, they would kind of spin underneath of her feet, and the, you're trying to get the, the ball out of the center, and it would fall straight down. And then Mike said, well, that doesn't really make sense because everything else in the game, the gravity goes towards the planets. What about if the little piece you're trying to get goes towards the girl? And so it became kind of a physics puzzle where you're moving around, and that was a lot better. They don't spin in the final game. It's just a stationary sort of puzzle. That worked pretty well. Um, around that time, just a lot of stuff is happening at once. Um, bouncy planets, um, super dense planets, water planets that you can go through, and um, a couple of others, like the timer planets and things like that, where you need to stay in the air for 10 seconds and then they slowly shrink down and then you can get the star. So really things that, that work with controlling momentum. Oh, ice planets as well. Um, I don't know if you can see this here, but I've, on the top right I've written a friendly note to myself to finish the art because they were going in so fast that I, I didn't have time to like finish the art. <laughs> um, so once we had those working, um, let me show you what the game looked like. I entered it in Sense of Wonder Night for Japan in 2013 and we didn't get in, but you know, useful exercise of putting a build together at least. Oh yeah, there was a little bit of story by then, but everybody just clicked through it, so I'm gonna do that too. <laughs> Starts to look a little bit more familiar at least. Flowy. It's not quite so snappy like elastic bands. This is one of the mazes. Um, people were having trouble telling which way the girl was going, you know, when she changed direction. So I added this little puff of smoke that happened when she changed direction. It didn't really help anything. The solution was to make the girl's art clearer. Um, but that's what those are. Here, I ended up playing it for like five minutes because it's really, really hard. Uh, so I didn't quite have like the design down yet, but at least it was getting in the right direction. Okay, um, some of the things that worked pretty well right away were the movement power-ups. Because you often feel so out of control in the game, anything that kind of restored some movement to the girl or some, some movement control to the girl was, was a good decision. So we didn't end up using all of these ideas. Um, but things like dash and heavy mode and extra jumps worked pretty well. Uh, and a glide, you know, so she can kind of parachute down. That all felt really good. Um, there were some other ideas that I should have known were not good because, you know, like shrink doesn't really tell you anything about, and to me it doesn't say anything about running and jumping, it's just kind of a, a variant, so we didn't end up using that one. 
Um, and then, so around this time, we still had the hair mechanic in the game where she got collected flowers and her hair got longer. And I very much liked collecting flowers in the game because it helped people have smaller goals within a level. You know, you don't have to just collect the star, there's some flowers too. It helps you kind of reward you for exploring and trying out different things in the levels. And I didn't want to get rid of them, but I didn't have a use for the terraforming anymore. Um, and so I think it was my husband Steve who said, well, how about this? How about you can like run around a planet with your hair and that changes the type of planet that it is. So you could, um, if you have like a slippery ice planet, you could get a fire trail, turn it into a fire planet and that will push you. Uh, and that uh, ended up working pretty nicely. So for instance, in a level that has a star way up high, you could take a planet, turn it into a fire planet and then when you hit jump, you're like a little cannon. You know, you try to aim the girl at where you want to go. And so that worked pretty decently. I got to save it, I got to keep my long hair mechanic that I really, really wanted. Um, as a little aside, I've been kind of amazed and shocked by how many like grown men have play tested this game and said things like, I love how long and beautiful my hair is. Like, I never, <laughs> never imagined that to be a power fantasy that, well, anyway, you learn very much a lot of things uh, making games. Uh, so the next couple things are some ideas that didn't quite work out the first time I, I built them. You know, I took some ideas and some iteration. Uh, things like the, the large creatures that I call the guardians, um, gear planets, animals, and then what I'll call the Icarus planets. So the guardians started out, uh, I wanted there to be creatures in the game that helped out the girl, but I wanted the game to still feel really lonely, and so I thought I should make the guardians really weird, so you wouldn't necessarily feel like you're making a, a very big connection with them. They're mostly just odd. And so I drew this deer, and I was like, I like this deer. What are some fun things I can do with my new friend, the deer? Um, and so I, I drew this uh, just sequence of events, and I guess the way I like to work is to start with a big idea and kind of get the feeling of that, and then pair it back into something small that I can then execute. So in this little exchange, the deer is like eating the girl, and she's like running in its stomach, and then it crosses a mountainscape, and then the deer spits you out, so you've kind of, I guess, driven in it like a Bjork music video. I don't know if you you know Bjork over here, but she's a very weird musician. Um, so that, I mean, that would have required way too many new features in the game, but the way the deer ended up working was that um, when you move, she moves, and when you jump, she jumps. So like, the puzzle in the game is like, you're on this single planet with the deer, and when you walk, you have to try to collect the thing that's between the deer's antlers, and so it ends up being a nice little movement puzzle. And I think that the idea was inspired by this kind of sketch of just a, a thought that I had in my notebook. Um, pretty much my, my experience with this game is like anything that uses the gravity tends to have a better chance of being successful. So I added this to the start of the deer puzzle where you have to collect her antlers and, and pull them back in because uh, they're just floating around in space and they, they follow very slowly. So you need to be moving very slowly to get them to follow you and then bring them down. So it's very much about that control. Uh, so that worked out pretty well. And this was my, my sketch for that. It worked out worked the first time. Yay, it doesn't always happen in game development. Um, the rest of the Guardians, I got ambitious and I, I drew up ideas for 12 of them. There's seven in the final game. Um, this is an idea that worked um, for the, the Wolf Guardian, I thought. You know, what, what, is his, what is the feeling of interacting with the Wolf Guardian? I didn't start with like, okay, what do I code? I thought, what is the feeling I want people to have? And I thought, well, what if it's playful like a dog? You know, what if it's like, you know, you're, how do you feel when you're playing with a dog when he's got a ball and he's like, you know, you're trying to get it from him and he's like getting away from you. So that's kind of where I, I came from with the idea. Uh, and so, in the end, he's got a piece of a planet in his mouth that you need to catch, and he moves and randomly in this level. He moves and runs and jumps randomly, so you get to kind of like feel like he's playing with you, even though it's random. <laughs> Most people can't tell the difference. Um, so the gear planets, this is my original idea for them. This is before I figured out how to use the hair properly. I knew that the trees didn't work, but I didn't know what to do with the hair, so I thought, what if you had these gear planets and you can act like a big bicycle chain to get them to turn? Um, and then I showed Mike this drawing and he said, there's no way we can do that, that's way too complicated. And I said, okay, all right. Um, but in this, there's this puzzle where you kind of circle them in this figure eight shape and they, you move these beams toward the star and that would let you put the star. I don't know, too many steps. So I, I didn't think about the gear planets for about a year and then I thought, well, what's, what would be cool is if you had a planet that was like a wheel that had momentum, you could get it spinning faster and faster and faster and then maybe it then slows down, but what would be interesting about that? Okay, then I had it so that this beam of light comes out when it's spinning faster, and that reveals the star. Uh, and so that ended up working pretty nicely. Just, it was like two days of work. It's always nice when, when things work out like that. But I still very much liked the directional beam idea, and so I made a special level. This is the Owl Guardian level, where you need to point the four beams at his little clock cabinet, I guess, like a cuckoo clock. Um, so it ended up, I saved the idea, got to use it in the game. 
Um, there are also animals in the game. There's 14 animals that you need to find. Um, these are tiny, they're around the same size as the girl. Uh, and I thought, I just kept thinking of like, what are some cute ideas? Like, what if um, there's a door you find that's all covered in grass that you can't go through, but then you bring some rabbits over and they eat the grass and go through the door, things like that, I don't know. Just trying stuff. Um, but then I, I sketched this out and I, I realized that, oh wait, it's silly to have them be real animals, they should be a ghost like her, she's a little, a little ghost girl. So now she's helping these ghost animals, and that was kind of the idea I needed to like make this idea work. So here's how it looks in the game, you have these animal spirits that then go with the girl, they ride along in her hair as she takes them. You need to take the spirits to their skeletons, kind of on the edge of cute and morbid where I like to live my life. Um, so one thing that we wanted to have was that the animals would run away from you. They'd, so we put in some code that made them run and jump randomly, but unfortunately, that usually meant that like, you start a level and the girl is just standing there and the animal's going, dip, 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 jumps right into you, and you collected it. It's like, oh my gosh, that's not very fun. Um, but I don't really know how to write an AI that will work in radial gravity space. I don't even know where to begin for that. And I'm like, oh, we're gonna have to cut this. You know, I was kind of distraught. Um, but then I, I thought about it. I thought, what if it's just like, you're controlling two players instead of one. What if you move and the animal moves, and when you jump, the animal jumps? And because of the way the planets are positioned, it's gonna feel like it's running away from you. You know, when you get close and you correct, it's gonna feel like it's getting out of the way. So that's what we ended up doing, and that's how the animals work. Um, almost nobody who played it had any idea that that's what was happening. They all thought, yeah, I, I hear like YouTubers, like, yeah, the animals will avoid you, they path fine. I'm like, mm-mm. <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors. Um, so these are the animals and their skeletons that you bring them to. Um, to kind of tie them back into the story of the game, I had it so that there are these, um, when, when you help out an animal, when you bring its spirit to its skeleton, then after that you get to see a cutscene. And so that's, um, a big part of the game is figuring out the story. And the way it's set up is you can really view the story pieces in any order. And I thought, rather than have it be an actual puzzle, just have it be something people have to put together in their mind. You know, they'll see a couple of cutscenes and they might think, who are these characters and what's going on? And it wouldn't matter like which order they saw them in as long as they had something to think about when they're playing the rest of the game. So it ended up working out uh, pretty well, I think. Uh, my background is actually in psychology. I worked um, uh, with rat brains at the start of my career. Uh, so I guess I, I learned from that that people, people are really good at putting things together. When you, when you give them incomplete information, people are really good at making the whole picture in their mind. So I thought, it's not really a game mechanic, but it is something that you do in the game as you put together the story, like it's a puzzle, even though you never like quiz on it. Um, finally, uh, I wanted there to be some, some version of the story that existed in the game world itself. Um, so I came up with this idea that at the center of the whole game world, there's this black hole with this planet that's uh, blown apart, and you're trying to bring the pieces back together. Um, and I thought it would be cool if, if the levels in this, um, if the, the planets in this level were different if they had platforms you could jump on as opposed to just moving through space. Uh, and the reason I thought this would work is because I worked on this game jam game called Dude Icarus. Uh, I designed this in uh, 2010. Uh, we worked on it for about two weeks. And basically the way it works is you're this little Icarus dude and he um, collects feathers in the game world. And each time you get a feather you get another jump. So he starts out with just a double jump and then you can go a little bit higher and then he another feather and then he has three jumps. And it feels very good if you're trying to get up the top of the game world where you hang out on the sun with Apollo, that's how you win. Um, so I started to make little planets that had platforms on them with little characters on them. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it, it wasn't as interesting as I thought because you ended up with a lot of empty sky where, for instance, there were clouds that moved around that you could stand on, but there was just a lot of waiting. There wasn't a lot of doing. And the rest of the game is so focused on movement and momentum, it felt just like a totally different game. Um, so that, that wasn't too good. So platforming wasn't fun. Um, so I had to like, I had spent all this time putting in these platforms and I just ended up cutting them because I was basically writing a whole separate movement scheme for that level itself. And that was just a, ended up not you know, working out well. So I went back to the drawing board and I thought, what do I like about this idea? Well, I like that there would be plans with special art that have little characters on them. Maybe you can talk to those characters. Um, so I'll show you what that ended up looking like.
for everybody to go see you might recognize some of these characters. I didn't actually have a story in mind when I was making this. I was just throwing stuff in there. It's still weird animal people because that's what I drew in my original notes. Um, but it, it's hard to tell from watching this, but it's actually really, really difficult to get around in this level. It's, you feel very out of control. The level's way too big. The plants are way too big. Um, but this is at least where it kind of crystallized for me that like, oh, this character is a ghost and they can't see her. And that's interesting because my original thought was like, oh, she meets these people, she goes on fetch quests for them, something like that. And I, it just didn't seem right somehow because the rest of the game is so lonely and melancholy. So that's where it kind of crystallized, like, okay, they can't see her. And that's already, I don't even have to code very much. Just having them unable to see her was, was interesting in and of itself. I mean, I think that's what you're trying to do when you're making a game is just make sure the player is always interested in what's going on. Cool. Um, so then, uh, to tie it all together, I, I cut the level down to a very small size. In this level, if there's this black hole at the center, you're putting this planet back together. So I just made everything into a planet shape. You're, you're finding these planet pieces. You can see my cursor, right? Yeah. So each of these pieces is what you get from the guardian creatures. You, you're collecting these. Um, and I ended up, uh, I was able to figure out a way to tie the, the magic elements and the terraforming uh, into this level as well. So it, got, it brought it all together in a pretty nice way. I won't spoil it, but there's a puzzle here that you need to use your different hair types, you know, earth and air and fire and things like that. So the last part I'll talk about uh, in terms of um, design, actually I don't think it's the last thing, never mind, scratch that. The next thing I'll talk about um, is really this idea of this narrative that was kind of in the background all along. Um, I had done some sketches very early on where it's uh, the girls, like in this one, it's just a girl having tea with a rabbit. I just thought that was cute and I, I didn't really have an idea except that there's this kind of moment of warmth between these two characters and the rabbit woman slowly turned into somebody more like a grandmother, but even in my kind of late sketches, she was still an actual rabbit. Um, but so you see in the final design of this character, who's just a, a human woman, that she has these long braids, kind of like rabbit's ears. Um, basically, I, I realized that they shouldn't just be random characters out in space. They shouldn't just be strange animal people. They should be people she knows from her life. Now she's interacting with them on kind of this like cosmic level where she's in the afterlife, but oh, here are these people from her life, and what does that mean? Um, there's a depth to it that now you can discover. And so here is the kind of evolution from this dear character turning into her older sister. Um, but all the characters kind of end up bearing a resemblance to the animal people that inspired them. This is her little brother who kind of looks like an owl, because that's what he was, and then Pepper was a mouse. And so um, each of these characters ends up corresponding to one of the guardians as well. Um, so, you know, for instance, the mouse guardian is voiced by the same actress as, as the little girl. Um, and not everybody caught that, but it's kind of like they have this big monster version of themselves out in space. Um, but some of the design characters of the characters, you know, stuck around from that earlier version, like her sister's veil is like deer antlers, sort of. So that was just my little, I guess, nod to where the game came from. So the experience of making half an hour of voice animation by yourself is not a very easy one, um, but I don't regret that time spent. I think it added something really valuable to the game. There, it's, nobody can really clone that. They have to do so much work. You know, the gravity mechanic is one thing, but I thought, Maybe people who play the game, they like the gravity mechanic, but they love the story, or maybe they love the gravity mechanic, but they, are, they only like the story. But it, I feel like giving people a couple of different hooks to get engaged in the game was, was the right idea. Um, if you're more interested in how I, I put these animations together, I actually did a stream about once a week when I was developing, just towards the very end. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, it's just Lively Ivy, and I talk a little bit about the, the animation and, and my process. Um, one of the last big decisions once all the game pieces were there, you know, it's like I've got these physics levels, I've got the, the Icarus level with the black hole in it, I've got uh, these different ideas that are all kind of working separately. Now, how do I figure out how to put the levels in the right order um, for it to be the most fun? And that was tricky because on this map screen that we built, um, I could define, you know, which level this node would go to, but it was just a string I had to type in with the level name. So it ended up like I delete a level from here and try to add it over here and then I forget what I was doing and the thing that disappeared from the map would end up in two places. And I was like, this isn't working. This process is just flawed. It's not easy to move things around. Like, I know it's on the computer, but it's just not easy to do this. So I kind of like took a step backwards. I said, what do I really want people to feel when they're going through this game? This progress, like they're building something bigger. So in this way, the map ends up showing you how much progress you've made in the game. Um, and, and so you can see here, I've kind of defined each I had constellation by which guardian it is. So Salamander Guardian, the Mouse Guardian, and then I kind of thought about what are some things that, what are the planet types you encounter in this constellation? 
what are the new plant types you encounter, and which ones do I think are easier and harder, and I can put them in an order that makes sense at least. Um, but in terms of like within each constellation, I'm like, how do I introduce the bouncy planets? How do I best introduce the breakable planets? I didn't really know what to do about that, and so I kind of went back and I studied one of my favorite independent games, which is called World of Goo. Now, can you show me, show of hands if you played that? Okay, not very many of you. Um, it's a very good game, you should check it out. Um, but I basically studied the way that they had set up their map level. Um, in the very first chapter, um, you play level one, level two. The colors here represent the different um, materials of the goo that you get in that level, if you like. Um, the, the part I'm gonna show you here is that this is like the regular type, regular type, and then level three, they show you this really weird new type of goo that doesn't show up again in the game until the end of chapter two. So it's like they're just hinting that there's further depth in the game. You just have to stick around and you'll get find this other cool stuff. You'll see here another thing they did is when the map first branches, you get a, a kind of a choice. Like this side, it teaches you about these balloon things that are lighter than air. And this side, it teaches you about these, uh, they're, they're IV. They're very, um, you can, I guess, rearrange them. It doesn't matter. It's just like a divergence in the new mechanic you're being taught. So I thought, oh, it's cool because it's making an actual choice on the map. You know, it doesn't even, you don't even necessarily know what you're going to go to, you just know that there's going to be a theme this way and a different theme if you go this way. Um, so I ended up just using that pretty much as is for my game. Um, to get around the problem of repeating levels and losing levels, I just took every level that I had made and I represented it graphically on a little note card. Um, the colors represent the types of planets that are in each level. The little M means that it's moving planets. Um, the T means there's terraforming. It was just a way for me to visually see like, let me make sure that when you go from level to level, you're getting variety. You know, in this constellation, you get, um, this one actually starts at the bottom here, you get the water planet, you get a totally different kind, then back to the water planet, and then this side introduces these pink ones, and this side goes towards these green ones. Um, so, usually by the end of this constellation, I try to like remix those ideas, so now we've got pink, blue, and green. And I try to make sure that even the planet types themselves didn't really repeat that much from level to level, uh, and that, you would never see like this particular combination again at the game. So I'd pair, I'd pair ice and water, I'd pair moving and breakable. I kept trying to recombine the same things to keep it fresh so that each level would feel unique. And that worked out pretty well, I think. Uh, so this is the, the kind of bird's eye view of the map level around that time as I started filling it in. Uh, and for my own sake, I just started to, I took a screen cap of that and I colored on it to see for myself like, what are some places that could use more variety? You know, here there's kind of a batch of bouncy planets. Maybe I should not use those for a little while. Uh, and then you see some, this is where we introduce the orange type, which is the, the timer planets, I believe. Sorry, those are the gear planets. Anyway, it, you know, it's kind of complicated looking, but for myself, I could see at a glance where everything was and where I maybe needed to add more variety. So that was a very helpful thing. Um, cool, and that's kind of the end of my design section. Um, Let's take a little pause here. I wanted to ask how many of you are students? Okay, I think that's most of you. How many of you work in the video game industry right now? Actually more, okay. How many of you would like to be full-time independent game developers? <laughs> or are already? Okay, cool. This is mostly who my talk is directed at now. Um, my experience is making these premium indie games where you pay once up front and then you have the game. Um, there are other indie games that do the free-to-play model. I encourage you to check out Spry Fox as a company um, or Slick Entertainment. Those are some that I've seen give presentations at GDC. They seem to really know what they're talking about. If you're interested, I think some of their talks are on the GDC fault. Um, but yeah, my, my, my experience has been with premium, so that's what I'm gonna talk about here. Um, this is assuming you have no budget. So this kind of open question I kept asking myself is without advertising, how do you reach a wider audience? And without advertising, how do you generate revenue? Two very important questions if you want to build a business. Uh, number one is to make your game easy to write about. Uh, and this comes down to having an internet presence where people can look and find information about your game. Uh, people check websites constantly, but what if they see your game and then you know, suddenly something else has their attention? They never come back, they never buy your game, you've lost them forever. What are some ways you can increase kind of people's exposure to your game? So, um, my kind of three recommendations for a web presence are to have a store page that has your basic information, to have a press kit, and to have social media doing this ongoing thing where people can subscribe to your updates, and I'll kind of go into more detail about those things now. Um, 
When you build a store page, you need to have a way to do payment processing. I use a thing called the Humble widget, uh, which I can show you. You can basically email Humble and get in touch with them. They're very nice. They're people who put on the Humble Indie Bundle. Show of hands, who knows the Humble Indie Bundle? Okay, interesting, not everyone. Um, it happens about twice a year. It's a big pay what you want sale. They'll put like five or six really nice indie games on sale. Most people pay about $4 to get all of them. So many people buy into it, it's a, it generally the developers end up getting a pretty nice cut from that. Um, but they make this kind of payment processor thing. So this is my uh, store website. Down here, this is the Humble widget. It does payment processing with um, credit card or PayPal or Amazon payments. It's just a, a nice way to do your payment processing. They don't, they don't take a very good percentage at all. Okay, so that, that's like step one, is having that internet presence. Um, I found it very helpful to read a, an online book called Copywriting for Geeks. Copywriting is the art of arranging things to make people more likely to buy something from you. Um, so here are my sketches for that store page you just saw, using the ideas that I learned from Copywriting for Geeks. Sorry, if you guys wanted to like write that down. This is my actual like big recommendation. I know it's a lot of money, but it was it paid for itself because it taught me how to make sales, right? So. Um, so here, uh, this is when it was still in pre-order. Um, great big headline, save the galaxy while saving a few bucks. Pre-order gravity goes for 33% off. Already implying a bit of a time pressure, right? Time pressure leads people more likely to buy. Down here we have what we call social proof. So I'm not just some random person on the internet asking for your money and your credit card. These normal places have written about me and know the game is real, I'm not a scammer, right? Down here, a great big pre-order now, you know, call to action. Because people forget what they're doing. They're like looking at a website, why am I here? Oh, I can pre-order this. Right? Um, look, we won an award. Now, all these things help add up to this picture of us being legitimate. Um, if you, you know, the trailer is front and center here, obviously. Um, but it's also got here our, our platform information, um, some well known voice actors, a um, couple paragraphs about what the game is. This is my page where it says, like, here's why you should pre order, you know, show people how much money they save by doing that. It's sim simple stuff, and it's, you've seen it probably everywhere, but it's good to, like, learn about this. It's a real, you know, there's a real science to it. People do this professionally. Um, you know, hurry, right? There's some screenshots for people. Um, I also do this thing where we gave away the MP3 from the trailer for free, and that's because of a thing called the reciprocity norm, where if you give people something for free, they're like more likely to want to reciprocate, more likely to buy your game. These are just things that they've discovered through the art of, you know, marketing. People who, at least the, the indie game developers I talk to tend to think of marketing as kind of an evil thing, but I just think of it as like, you need to be able to talk about what's cool about your game, and you need to know what's cool about your game and convince other people of that, and that's a real, if you can't sum up what your game is in two sentences, people won't know what it is. You know, you need to think about the message that you're sending. And down here, more social proof, nice things people said about the game, and then, you know, press kit, which I'll talk about now. Um, I was going to say about the store page, we opened for pre-orders in August of 2013. It funded us until we launched in January 2015, so take my word for it. Um, a press kit, so if you want to think of the store page as where gamers go to find out what your game is, this is where the press goes to find out what your game is. This is how you make it very easy to write about you. This is a free tool developed by an indie company called Flambeer. It basically is a bunch of prompts in uh, an XML file, just like Two sentences about your game, which platforms, how do people get in touch with you, upload some screenshots. It's very, very simple. You just need to know a little bit about how to make a website. Um, so this is the press kit for Gravity Ghost. I'll just show you. I even think it could have been better, but it's it's very simple. What is Gravity Ghost? It's a physics game with a twist. You know, here's a little bit more information. Bulleted list with some features, um, trailers, right, screenshots for people who want to write an article. Like, already somebody could write a news article and could talk about this if they wanted to. It's all just front and center, you know. They don't even have to consult you. Anything that, like, reduces that friction to somebody writing about you is good. Um, you know, logos, more nice things people have said, some awards we've got. Um, you can just have them all in the same place. So that's what a press kit is and why you should have one. Cool. All right, social media. Uh, it is a place for people to, to subscribe to you. Like I said, people are constantly sifting through the internet. You just want them to have a way to like, just hang on to those people who are already interested in your game. So, your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I, I use primarily Facebook and Twitter, but I should probably get on Instagram because that's what the young people are doing. Um, I think that my biggest advice is to be entertaining. Don't just 
be like, okay, we've announced our platform, and it's PC, Mac, and Linux. Like, try to be fun. You know, we are making entertainment, and I know it's easy when you're working on a game to get really depressed about, oh, I have to fix all these bugs, and you do this and that, but like, remember that like your public persona should be kind of this, I don't know, this version of yourself that's very excited about what you're working on, because you are, that's why you're a game developer. So building a following like that takes a lot of time, but it also pays off. You know, just be your true self and speak honestly, and I think that that's the best advice I can give. There's no like fast track to having a social media following. Just try to be authentic and, and valuable by the, the advice you give. Okay, so that's kind of my my idea about how to um, build your online presence. Now, how do you reach that wider audience without without advertising? Um, you have to send your game to the game's press directly. Don't assume that they'll see that your game is cool and come to you. They probably won't. They're very busy. Um, you can email them. A lot of their, um, you know, like Rock Paper Shotgun has a masthead page with all the people's names and emails. Um, one thing you can do is create a spreadsheet with just email addresses of those people. Um, even you can put in their first name if you want. And then automatically use Mail Merge to just generate an email from that. And that's good if you want to give out a bunch of Steam keys, too. You can have a column in the spreadsheet that's just Steam keys that get assigned uniquely to each person. It's very handy. I use a service called MailChimp for that, uh, and that's free. Um, but when you write to the press, try to think about creating something worth sharing. Like I said, they're always being bombarded by stuff. You need to find something about your game that stands out. Now, part of my philosophy when I made Gravity Ghost is this is a game you should be able to share with your loved ones. Even people who don't play games or like games, I want it to be like, here's the game you give to your parents to convince that the games are worthwhile. You know, I think we all know people in our lives who don't, don't understand our, what we do. Um, and so I just kind of came up with this idea of like, okay, well, I don't know how to reach this audience who doesn't play games. I don't, I can't advertise like they can with the Wii. You know, that was an example of a platform that was made for people who weren't gamers per se. So I came up with this idea that when you buy a copy of the game, you get an extra copy for free. You give that away to someone in your life who doesn't play games. I, I said, you know, find that person in your life, whoever that is, and give them this extra copy. So I kind of created this little story, this interpersonal sort of relationship now that I have to gravity goes. Um, and so that's how I opened up the email. I tried to create this kind of, not just a game announcement, but also this kind of feeling about, you can bring more people into our, our hive. <laughs> Our, uh, our collection here. So this is my template for the um, announcement for Gravity Ghost coming out. It says, Gravity Ghost is here. Here's your Steam key. Here's your second Steam key. Allow me to explain. And then I explain the two for one thing, this kind of design philosophy that was behind it. And then I talk about what is the game. You know, it's a planet hopper. Um, you see here, this is where the mail merge will just put in the Steam key from the spreadsheet. You know, you can put in the person's first name if you want. You can get fancy with it. I have a friend named Michael Todd who's a developer. He writes to people each individually, he once spent a whole month writing people. He didn't let him copy. He didn't like copy anything into the email. He typed it all from scratch every time and just tailored it to that individual person. And that's the thing you can do. And that, it, it, I think it's worthwhile, but it takes a lot of time. So there's no, there's no fast way to do this. There's just different ways to reach out. But basically, send out copies of your game. Um, so that's the game's press. There's also YouTubers, which I know Howard's excellent talk this morning talked about how important YouTubers are to uh, getting eyeballs on your independent game. Um, you can search for channels that cover your genre of game and then reach out to them. Every YouTuber, go to their about page. There's usually an email address. Somebody like Total Biscuit probably has a person who answers his emails, right, to kind of filter through them. But you might get really lucky. Like, he ended up playing the game and he actually really liked it, which, what? <laughs> like, that surprised me uh, a lot. But it ended up getting a lot of views for us and it was very, very helpful because he, he knew we were launching on the played it and, and that, that weekend he knew we were launching on Monday, so he like rushed to get the video done to coincide with our release date. It was very nice of him. Um, but the moral of the story here is not that like sometimes you get really lucky. This happened because I wrote to a lot of YouTubers, and you know there's just a percentage of them that will click through. You can't force these things, but you can kind of cast your net very wide and hope that some of these things start to to uh, pay off for you, I guess. Okay, so that's that sums up my section about how to reach a wider audience without spending any money. Um, let's talk about generating revenue. So first things first, uh, your burn rate is how much money you spend every month just living. And maybe you rent an office space, or maybe you pay a, a contractor to work with you. If there are ways to decrease that amount of money, that increases the amount of money you make, right? So I went and I slept on that futon for a year to reduce my burn rate, because it gave me a lot more time to work on the game. That was something I did. Can you move back in with your parents? Then you don't have to pay rent. You know, if you're going to do the indie games thing, you need to take it very seriously. You know, I, whether or not you want to go into debt is a question up to you. But I personally am not comfortable with that. So I thought 
I have to reduce my expenses down to a point where I can I can make this game over the course of several years. So just keep thinking about ways to bring down your burn rate. You know, cook at home. You know, move in with your friends. I, I don't know. That's up for you. Up, up to you to decide. But that will increase ultimately the amount of revenue you get. So that's step one. <laughs> Now, in terms of actually generating revenue, I think that the way to do the indie games thing right now is to develop for multiple platforms. Um, for Steam, you know, you can get on a Steam green light. Um, even here, I'm trying to think of, I try to say things here that I think you could do from, from here from Taiwan, you know. Um, Steam green light will give you some experience trying to get a community supportive of your game and to get them mobilized to do something. You know, that's a good way to practice for things like a community involvement. Um, you know, because we used Unity to make the game, um, we were able to reach out to Sony and say, hey, we'd like to develop for the PS4. You can just schedule a meeting with them. Um, I met Sony uh, 2013 at, at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, but there's other events around here. I know for a fact there's GDC China and things like that. You can just try to write an email to somebody and say, hey, we have this game, can we meet with you about this? And they might say yes. Um, if you're gonna do mobile, you know, really, there's so many mobile games have coming out all the time, you really need to be featured by Apple or somebody in order to get that visibility. And so maybe if you don't know somebody from Apple, you can reach out to a mobile developer who you trust, maybe somebody you know personally, and say, hey, you know, I have this game. Um, would you mind just sending me an introductory email to this person you know at Apple? And it's such a small favor that they might just say yes. Um, one piece of advice my, my father gave me is, people want to help you, right? And so they want to see you be successful, so all you have to do is ask sometimes, and that's a really good way to, to break through that uh, initial kind of wall of communication. So these are the revenue streams, streams for Gravity Ghost. Um, like I said, it's because we use Unity, we were able to launch with cross-platform support. So Steam has uh, PC, Mac, and Linux support. Um, we did the Steam Summer Sale earlier this year. We did a Humble Weekly bundle just a couple weeks ago. It was a Humble Female Protagonist bundle, and that was nice, just a, a fun category. Um, and the Humble Bundle is nice because a part of the percentage of the profits goes to a charity, and this charity was like, help girls learn how to make games, and so it kind of had this nice feel-good message to it. And I think, you know, that's, that's a nice thing. Um, we're developing now for the PS4, uh, and we're thinking about maybe mobile. It remains to be seen. I'm not sure if it's possible, but we might, might give it a try. But it's, this is a long list of things, right? So no one of these platforms is enough to like keep our business going, but like all together, they are, they are good. Um, so finally, uh, combining the game development side and the business side, this is how we pulled the game together uh, to, to the road to launch, basically. Um, we had a weekly meeting. Uh, it was usually Sunday afternoon, we all met on Skype to talk about priorities and tasks. We used something called Pivotal Tracker to keep track of our tasks and our bugs that we needed to fix. And Pivotal Tracker is cool because if something's more priority, you can just drag it and drop it higher in the list of things. Um, how, do you, how many of you know about Scrum or Agile Development? Show of hands. Okay, lots of you. So Pivotal basically is a, a Scrum sort of thing. I mean, you can do Scrum at your office by using a whiteboard with post-it notes. I encourage you to look into it if you don't know what it is. It's a good way to make sure everybody's always knows what they're working on and that two people don't end up doing the same thing at the same time. It solves a lot of problems that way. Um, I hired somebody to do quality assurance for me, uh, testing bugs, playing the game, and communicating with our testers. Um, that was a worthwhile expense. I just uh, I wrote to somebody who had been a very good student of mine. I said, are you doing anything right now? Can you help me out with my game? Um, and so he ended up doing like, maybe five hours a week. It ended up not being very much time, but it helped immensely. And it meant that I didn't have to, I guess, interface with the, the bugs and stuff. Like, when you work with playtesters, they give you feedback and not all of it is useful. So it was useful having a person designated to be that filter, so I didn't have to like get bogged down thinking about, I guess, things that were inconsequential. Uh, and yeah, we just recruited testers from Twitter <laughs> and that they were happy to, to play the game for free early if it meant you know, helping us out. Uh, we used a private forum for doing bug reporting, you know, just like an internet forum. Uh, and that was nice. So we actually learned a pretty valuable lesson doing this um, because we had started out just, we had a Google forum where it's like, did you find a bug? Type it into this little window. And people would type in like two bugs and then quit because that's no fun. You know, it feels like doing homework. But when we set up a forum, people have usernames and they can start a thread like, I found this bug. Somebody else can say, I found that one too. It actually became sort of a community by the end of it because people are trying to help, you know, I got this bug once, I don't know how to reproduce it, somebody else can try. It ended up being a great thing, so learn from my example. <laughs> um, so another thing we did, we created a press kit. It was about a year and a half before launch that we did this. We took the game to PAX, we paid for a booth space to kind of 
announced to people that Gravity Ghost was a game that existed. It coincided when we announced our pre-orders, so August 2013, about a year and a half before the game came out. That's when we really started to try to build awareness of the game. Not two weeks before, you gotta kind of build it over time. So, I don't know. I don't know what analogy I would use. It's just something you need to like put work into over time to build it up. Um, and then we used MailChimp to email the press. Um, we created a gameplay trailer and a story trailer. Um, gameplay trailer got a lot of views, story trailer did not, but I think both were a useful exercise. Um, I would also recommend, uh, I actually also made a video where I'm just talking about the game, whereas you see me and people on the team, and that helps put a human face to the game if people ever want to know, you know, who are you, who made this thing? So once we started to get some feedback, some reviews came in, I got to, I, I updated the trailer and added the words like you saw at the beginning, and that helps convince people it's a worthwhile thing. Um, but the result of all this, all this work, is that people like it. Um, it's actually 98% positive reviews on Steam, it went up. <laughs> um, some people said some really lovely things about it. Um, Taku liked it, Little Biscuit liked it. Uh, and the game's profitable. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, so that's, that's my story, thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, hello, my name is uh, Hanson Lee. Thank you very much for sharing these uh, wonderful ideas. I have one question specifically for uh, your uh, you, uh, kind of encouraging uh, the developers to uh, focusing on multiple multiple uh, platforms to uh, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, I heard some, uh, some maybe we can call it tragic stories that developers end up uh, pouring so much resources and time, even money into uh, um, uh, optimizing <laughs> games for multiple um, the uh, platforms uh, yeah. and, and, and drag all the development process down. I, I wonder uh, how do you suggest that we can deal with this? I mean, our, our way of doing that was to use Unity, you know, I, Unity gets a bad reputation from people I know who are like C++ programmers, they feel like the optimization isn't good, the garbage collection isn't good, whatever, but for us, we made a 2D game with simple physics in it, it's enough for us and it lets us do the multi-platform thing, you know, you have to figure out how much time you're going to put into the port and hope that it, uh, do, do some calculations to see if you think it will be worth the money, um, it's like, it's always really hard, and you know, there's no guarantee of success. And like, part of my philosophy here is like, try to structure things so that even if you crash and burn and fail, you're not like financially ruined, right? Like, I try to always stay uh, in the black. You know, it didn't go into debt or anything. Just like, even if it all goes to hell, I can go get another job after this. You know, so uh, try to prepare for the worst case scenario. But try to be very safe and think about what you're doing. You know, don't just say this is my dream. I'm going to do it. Like, think really hard about stuff. I'm, like the camp grandmother, you know, just like <laughs> think about what you're doing, yeah. Okay, so I think it's okay to wrap it up. Uh, okay, okay. alright. So,